First off, I just want to say congratulations. I mean, like everybody else, I want to join in the huzzas for this movie. The Voyeur <laughs> is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Uh, what I, the first thing I want to ask you is, did you, did you have a eureka moment when you first thought of the idea like, oh my God, am I brilliant or what? <laughs> well, it's not like, am I brilliant? But the idea did hit me. And it was the answer, I think a lot, probably like in the sciences, you know, and you're kind of experimenting or you're trying to, crack something and you just wake up in the morning with you know that yeah. discovery or that eureka moment i had it because i had been thinking about it for two years or so i was trying to tell a story about childhood uh -huh. and i couldn't light on the one moment and it's a real limitation in filmmaking you could write a book and you can cover your whole you know cover all these years but in film right. you can't ask a you know eight-year-old to play a 12 year old all of a sudden you know you, right there's these limitations you have yeah. to pick your spot kind of and i was having trouble my ideas were so dispersed over the whole gamut of it that i'd kind of given up on the idea of it as a film because i didn't really have one moment and uh, i was going to write something because i wanted to express all this and just as i sat down to write it proving i'm not a novelist i'm a <laughs> filmmaker I, I sit down put my hands on the keyboard and i swear boom this idea comes to me like, oh, you could just film a little bit every year and then yeah. it would work and it would be this cumulative effect and it would just flow and you could tell us. It was a new way to tell a story. It hit me. Yeah. And everything was right there. The 12 year grid, I call it, you know, the institutionalized upbringing we all have. Yeah. First through 12th grade, you know. And then it, it, the tone of it, the way it transitions, the feel, and everything kind of came within that one. Flash. Oh, that's great. So you actually did recognize the brilliance of it when you had it. <laughs> well, I, I recognized the answer to my problem. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I answered I, the discovery I was looking for to tell the story the way I really wanted to. Yeah. I cracked my own little narrative code. Yeah. So that's, that's what happened. But that's the good news. The bad news is how do you get such a crazily impractical idea made yeah. in a business that, that, yes. Yeah. Um, so that, that was the crazy. That's part. the next one. Let's let's hold off that thought yeah. for right now and just focus on this idea. To, does it seem like it's such a great idea, great premise, or uh, I don't know what you yeah. some people would call it a stump, but it's such a great notion to justify a movie. Did it feel foolproof to you? Because in a lot of ways, it feels like how can you miss? It's so brilliant the idea. I don't even care what comes oh. out of it. The very notion behind it makes it. Well, I guess, but. What I was going for wasn't, I could explain it in those terms. Oh, everyone will get older and we'll play out all these years. Oh, cool, cool. And then I said, well, what happens? What's the content? And I was like, uh, it's just little moments of life. You know, yeah. I didn't, it wasn't a huge, crazy, throttling um, narrative. You know, yeah. it, was a, it was just this accumulation of time. And so that was my other part that I didn't talk about so much, because that's really the essence of the movie. But I guess you're right. It, you could tell almost any story if it worked, but I didn't want it to be a stunt. I didn't want it to feel like an experiment. I would think if people yeah. come away with that, it really fails. If they yeah. don't identify with the characters or care about them in some way, I, I would consider it a failure. Yeah, know? well, so in fact, that's what I was going to ask you. In, in what ways could this film, this idea for a film, fail, and how did you guard against that happening? Oh, I think it could fail in a lot more ways. Like anything, <laughs> it could fail in a lot more ways than it could succeed. Really? <laughs> it could yeah? succeed in one way, yeah. in my mind, and fail in a lot of ways. And would that have been... Uh, I mean, something as mundane as financing, or would have been uh, something like casting, or... Everything. Yeah, yeah, you make one, you know, film, you make one wrong move, and you don't have the film you... The film in your heart is not up on the screen. Okay, but the thing is, what's brilliant about this movie, or what's really bizarre about this movie, is that you you basically filmed one little bit for two, three or four days, right, yeah. over 12 years. Mm -hmm. Could one of those years sunk the ship? In other words, let's say you really liked what you did year one, yeah. year two, year three, year four. Oh, man, that was a bad year. I mean, bad year. Just just fourth, fourth grade never happened. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. yeah. It all had to It all had to work, yeah. you know? You just, I'm sorry, but, you know, like a lot of films, you, you, there's no second chance. You can't go back and reshoot. We have the economic limitation, but you couldn't three years later decide to go do something. It all had to work. But I was editing the whole time. I had this yeah. incredible... 
some of these are luxuries. I mean, some of these are the downsides, but the luxury of the whole thing, the upside, was incredible gestation time. I had a year on average to contemplate the next episode. Yeah. I could look at all the footage edited together, put it with everything, this this growing mass of film, think about it, think about the relationships, what the film needed. You know, film doesn't give you that. Yeah. You, you're rendering, you have X amount of days to make your script and then you have post and then it's coming out. and It's all money and time, like any manufacturing situation. Art isn't, <laughs> film's kind of not a lot different. You have to hang on to your art. Yeah. You're often alone in that practically. You know, because it's so much, of, you know, it's being, there's time is money. So this was so free from that. It yeah. felt like a, like a sculpture of time we yeah. were doing. It didn't even feel like a movie. Yeah, well, I can imagine that. Now, the thing is, you mentioned editing. So let's talk about the practicality of the editing. So my understanding is that after each year of, of filming, or the few, mm. three or four days per year, that you would then edit that right then, mm -hmm. so that by year two, you already had edited year one? Yeah, sure. The thing is, is that what if something happened in year four? Now, I was just imagining. So let's say that you happened to film a scene. It was something about how he can't stand milk or something, and that didn't make the cut. And yet in year four or year five, there was some big confrontation that involved milk. Could you then go back and say, you know, I think we shot something about milk that you could have used back in year one that <laughs> foreshadowed what happened in year four. Did you do any of that, or was that ever an, a, a concern, or would that, would, have been, would that have disrupted the brilliance of your plan? <laughs> <laughs> well, there wasn't a lot of... I mean, there were nice echoes throughout, but I don't think there were a lot of plot points that needed to be hit like that, or yeah. the ones that were, they just were. Yeah. So, and it, there's not a lot on the editing room floor. I mean, it, it really, there's so much that's there, so I didn't really, I cut a lot of little things that I thought, well, that that's not really taking off. Yeah. Usually it was my own interests. I like, uh, that was more of a thought than a real experience or oh, something. Oh, yeah. So we... Yeah, it, it just sort of worked. But at the very end, I mean, 10 years later, I'm editing stuff I shot 10 years ago. And it's like, you know, I seem to remember there was a girl in that scene who gave an expression. Let's go look for that footage. And I would, I was still working on it. Oh, you stuff. did? Really? Yeah, oh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so still looks... feeling. If, if 10 years later something still bothered me, yeah. I would keep wow. working on it. The other fascinating thing about doing something over such a long period of time is, did you ever tire of the project? Either psychologically or artistically, or I'm not just physically. You know, it's kind of you don't allow your mind to go there. You, okay. You're committed. Oh, good. It's like a long term relationship, though. Yeah, you have your ebb and flow. Like, right. I'm busy. I just came off this thing I'm doing, and oh, now Ethan's or Patricia's schedule, we have to shoot that in a month, in four weeks. And yeah. okay, I got it. Like, okay, yeah, well, let's do it, you know? Yeah. You push through. Yeah, you just yeah. you you man up. You uh, you're committed. You know. So, but I no one really wavered. Yeah. No one, the cast, anybody. It was a fun thing to do every year. It was like this living life project. Yeah, it was fun that's to very cool. Get the team back together. Every and year. and did you? I mean, are were there some years in the, in a child's life? Are there some years that are more developmentally interesting than others? And if so, because I know you and you kind of blocked it out that you do maybe ten minutes a year or something. Were there and because. It is so seamlessly edited that you don't even notice that you're in a new era until you actually see, you know, the manifest the boy or the girl is suddenly a little a little older. Did did you actually do you know feel like okay I'm going to give and I I'm picking fourth the fourth year I don't know why if fourth grade's a big year or not are, were some were some years that we went back and actually broke it down frame by frame you know this year got twice as much time as that year or no it was pretty pretty consistent yeah. uh, every year was you know. 15 or so minutes and um yeah there was no no real um rule yeah. at first i thought oh 10 minutes a year but that wasn't enough the film really wanted to have more yeah it just i, I gave it up a long time ago this film was going to be what this film had to be yeah whatever it was going to be so but it's very organic i was very aware i mean i had all that gestation time with the actors on a year by year basis and mm -hmm. it was fun for me to realize, oh, they're going through a, what, call it an awkward age or anything to cap, to be capturing that. The makeup lady would say, oh, you know, Eller's got some pimples on his forehead. Should we cover that up? I'm like, hell no. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Exactly. I want to see those pimples. <laughs> I you know, like. doing it. If Ethan had pimples, maybe you'd cover yeah, them up, yeah. but not. That's, the, that's yeah. the point. And then, so what I want to know is now, would the 2002 Richard Linklater 
be proud of the 2014 result of his <laughs> labor that he was launching all those many years ago. He would be greatly relieved <laughs> on all fronts. Yeah. He'd be okay. happy he's still here. Yeah. Uh, the world is all, <laughs> seemingly, we're all here. Yeah. And uh, no, it would be whatever pitfalls or disasters loom, like they do in all of our lives. There's a life analogy to all this. People say, well, what if one of your cast members would have died? I go, well, I hope my first thought wouldn't have been, oh, my movie, you know, it's a life problem. <laughs> right. You know, it's like, exactly. statistically, that phone could ring for any of us at all times, yeah. in every angle of our life. It often doesn't. You know, you can proceed into the future thinking statistically we'll probably all, you know, when I first approached yeah. Patricia Arquette with the movie, I said, well, where are you going to be 12 years from now? You're an actress. <laughs> You'd probably be looking for a good part. I'm a director. I'll be trying to make a movie. I see. You know, oh, you have to think long term, but yeah. you know, likely we'll be where we are here just yeah. 12 years down the road. You can't really do that to a six or an eight year old. Yeah. You know, they don't have no idea what 12 years is, but yeah. an adult, it's an adult decision. So, so you me you've mentioned that although you didn't know where the film was going to go, you had this basic idea. It was going to mm -hmm. be this boy growing up, but that you had in your mind from the get go the final shot. And indeed, you use that final shot, yeah. the, the final shot of the entire movie. How true is that, <laughs> or is it just it's a great true. story? And it wasn't from the get -go. it was from okay. about the second year. Okay. Yeah, I and just wanted to get through that first year and kind of feel my way, but it was pretty early on. Yeah. I had a, it was, it's actually a subtle bookend to the first shot of the movie. He's alone looking up at the sky, and I thought, oh, at the end, it'd be kind of cool. I knew he'd go off to college. What if he meets someone... And they're together. He just ends with someone else. You know, yeah. Like he's not alone. Oh, you know, that's good. That was kind of my central thought. There. That's from. Because I was going to ask you, do you want to describe how you saw the final shot? But you sort of gave us an idea of what that final shot is. Yeah. But, well, it's that moment. You know, he's he's broken away from everything that came before. He's off at college. You know, yeah. You just showed up at college. You meet your new people. You know, yeah. roommate. Oh, your roommate's girlfriend and I guess her roommate, you know, yeah, just, oh, we're going out to the, we're going to go hiking, sure, yeah. you know, pop brownie, okay, yeah. you know, <laughs> whatever, let's go, and uh, yeah, so it's just a moment, the whole movie's a lot of little moments, and that yeah. last shot is really about, they actually talk about it, Yeah, uh, they talk about life is these these moments, so I don't know, it just seemed, and the sun was going down, and that was the actual last thing we shot. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, and then the last thing you shot emotionally, what was that like for everybody? This is a, the culmination of 12 oh years. Oh, my God. It's, I'll never have another experience like that. I'm, I'm very sure of it because, you know, even if you do a three-day shoot, the last uh, every day there's the martini shot, which uh -huh. is the last shot of the day. Uh -huh. Just so people can, oh, it's the last shot, so after this we can start, yeah. you, know, you know, packing up or whatever we got to do to get out of here. So every day you have that, and then you have the la the martini on the last day of shoot, which you can kind of feel it in the crew. It's like, ah, oh, it's the last shot of the whole shoot. So everything on this movie is what it usually is times 12. So you can imagine year 12, the last shot of a 12-year movie. It was yeah. like the whole crew, we were just kind of like, mm. but, you know, yeah. we're busy. The sun is, we're in magic hour. We have to get it. But when it was over, I remember Eller came up. We were just kind of staring at each other like, what did we just do? We just finished, like... We just hugged for like three minutes straight. It was like, what is this? And I was like, it was magical. It was yeah, crazy. Dude. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I still haven't really processed this film being over. You know, yeah. I just, because it was such a long term thing. I guess a year after we don't shoot for the first time, yeah. you know, it'll be like, oh, I guess we're done with that movie. Even <laughs> if it's, even that, though people are watching it, we're showing it here and saying, oh, tomorrow night. Yeah. I still don't think it's over in some strange way. It feels like we're still making it. Yeah, that itch that you won't scratch yeah, anymore. It's, I've so, never had an experience like that. Everything's different. One of the things about, you mentioned this uh, in this interview too, but this, you mentioned the kind of, the institution of first, you know, first grade to uh, to high school or graduating mm -hmm. high school, it's like, you were you described it, or I, I've read that you've called childhood like a cell, or it's like an <laughs> institution. Did, ch does childhood, prison. is your notion of childhood like a prison sentence? Because it is 12 years after it's all. It's a 12 year sentence. But, um, I mean, how well, would you characterize childhood? I remember at some point realizing, I don't know, I forget what age, but it's like, oh wow, I'm kind of, I'm totally beholden. Like my parents want to do this, and you have no agency. You know, you're like, oh, I've got to, we're moving. Yeah. You're just told what, oh, we're moving and you're leaving your friends behind or, oh, we're changing schools or you're just being whisked along other people's lives. And, yeah. 
and as you, I remember starting to struggle with that, like, I well, kind of want my own life. Yeah. And then you realize, oh, I'm still stuck in <laughs> this house with these people and in the school system until a certain age. And then, you know, it felt like freedom, like that was your release date. So yeah. that early on, it was just emotional memory. I was thinking, okay, that's where it ends when you break out of that. Now you I, leave your parents' house and you, you're on your own. I mean, you're still, so, if you're going to college, you're still in some kind of yeah. system, but it's your own. It's your own choosing in a way. Yeah. It, makes, it makes perfect sense. What, what I'm wondering about that feeling is, like, is this, in, in some ways I know it's, uh, the time period is different, but do you feel like this is recreating a version of your own childhood? In a way, I, I always call this a collaboration between, like, my childhood, Ethan Hawke's childhood, Patricia's childhood, the real childhoods yeah. from, the, from the past, the current childhoods of the, the two actors playing these kids. And, you know, it was a collaboration of, of that. Yeah. You know, it's the same way, it's sort of a collaboration with my own parents. Yeah. And the parent I am, or yes. trying to be, you know, it's, it's from all directions. But, yeah, that was kind of the backbone was a lot of it was pretty personal. If not specifically autobiographical, yeah. it's, it's personal. Yeah. You know, it's little things you remember and, you know. All kinds, of, maybe the emotion of a moment too. Have your parents seen the film? Uh, no, yeah. they haven't yet. They will soon. My sisters saw it. I have two older sisters. Uh -huh. It really it conjures up a lot, but it does for people who don't know. I mean, I've noticed yeah. with people who have no connection to the movie, telling me they they called up their parents after seeing it and yeah. realized what they must have been going through when they went off to college. You know, all the little things. It, I think it conjures up a lot in people. And I'm happy if, if that happens. But yeah, in my own world, I, I was a little, I'm actually a little nervous, I'll admit, for my parents to see it. <laughs> well, well, I mean, even starting 12 years ago, I was like, had I known they'd both still be alive, I don't know if I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. The thing is, you know, I, I really do think, I, I think someone has said this, that I think in order to really appreciate this movie, I think it can be appreciated at all different levels, but I think... The most, the strongest emotional impact will be parents. Yeah. I mean, like my daughter is now 21, so not that mm. far off from the from the subject of your movie. And it's like it is so realistic in terms of what it feels like to have raised these kids. Like, how did that happen? Yeah. It's just like I mean, they were just these little things so I so know. little ago. Yeah. It, it has that kind of naturalistic rhythm. Is this really a movie about parents' take on childhood more than it, the child's? It is equally. It could have been called, it's called Boyhood. It could have been called Parenthood. I think that was already taken. <laughs> That's already been taken. It could have been yeah. called Ordinary People. I think that was taken. <laughs> we'll go with Boyhood. But, uh, <laughs> That's good. But uh, yeah, I would say it's a portrait of growing up, but it's also a real portrait of kind of bumbling through this parenting thing. You yeah. know, that's how I think we've all felt, and yeah. all the adults in the film. <laughs> so that's very real. And I remember Ethan Hawke was talking about that. I showed him some footage, probably half the movie, you know, we're pretty close collaborators in yeah. that way. And he looked at it and goes, wow, they grow up. We age. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Isn't that funny? That's exactly <laughs> right. Uh, so... One of the key things about this uh, movie is who you happen to cast as your boy, yeah, as mm -hmm. Mason. And as what I'm wondering about is how would you describe Mason as a character, and how how similar is he to the actor who played him? And did they fuse in the end? Yeah. What you talked about agency? It's really about a boy who learns agency ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Well, how would you care? How would you describe his personality or his character? Comes into himself. Well, I met this very kind of interesting, ethereal, six-year-old boy, and I met a lot of kids, and I sort of bet on him, and, and his parents, you know, he had cool parents, I thought, this is a big commitment, and it's yeah. the parents making the commitment, sure. a six-year-old can't commit right. to 12 years, yeah. that's illegal, <laughs> you know, so they were both artists, you know, and I thought, well, this is maybe this artistic project, they could see it as a positive thing in their son's life, and, and you know, they're along for the ride, too. And it, it did turn out to be that way. It, yeah. it was kind of a wonderful experience, I feel, for, for everybody involved. But um, So that was a big part of it. But he was just, you know, he wasn't really reading yet. He was a little unconventionally schooled. And mm -hmm. I just liked the way his mind worked. But it was a little, you know, you're staring at this kid going, like, who are you going to be? Yeah. But you do that with your own kids. But you're not betting <laughs> yeah. a project or the anything farmer. on him. But, but I, I committed to him. I just said, the way he... We commit in life all the time sure. to things around us, you know? He's just like, well, I'm in it for the long haul. Wherever you go, 
the film will go. Yeah. If you grow up to be this kind of person, it'll be kind of about that person if you go this. And I feel like at the end of the line, I just got so lucky. He's such an interesting young kid. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a 19-year-old young man who I think is a really fascinating guy. And he grew up to be kind of rock star, good looking <laughs> <Yeah>. to boot, <laughs> you know? It's like, wow, you're really striking looking too. Damn, you grew up to be James Dean. <laughs> and he, his interest in photography, is that fictionalized or does he have a real interest in photography? Yeah. You know, because of it, his father's a musician and he was growing up in Austin, Texas, I felt like, oh, he's going to be a musician. By the time he's a teenager, we're going to have a band and that'll be fun. He'll be a band the soundtrack, possibilities. And he didn't really go that way. He's more of a visual artist. He was taking pictures, he was painting and drawing. And I thought, well, that's good too. You know, I thought, well, go this photography. That was closer to me. I wasn't a musician, but I was taking pictures yeah. and writing and. You know, so that was even closer. So I thought, well, let's let's go with this photography. It thing. sort of it, it emphasizes the observer aspect. Yeah, kind of the passive thing. And I think, in some ways, it's a reflection of you too. I really much think closer that, to home. Much closer yeah. to home for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, there. I, I just got the signal, so I've got five more pages of questions I want to ask, but I'll zero in on a couple of things. First of all, I want to ask you, aesthetically, does the if you would cast like traditionally, if you would cast a different actor. As a consumer, so you had like a, a six-year-old or an eight-year-old, and then you cast a ten-year-old in this. It was actually cast more conventionally. How would the actual quality of the film differ, do you think? Oh, it, it's just, I can't even think of it. It's, it's so, this is so part and parcel, the idea of what the film is. It's just a different film. Yeah. You see, you know, I read a thing recently, it's a big New Yorker article about, um, you know, digitally aging people and enhancing, you know, that. Right, yeah. Pretty fascinating, but I thought, you know what? Geeks, you know, people like to geek out on that thought of, but you know what? It's still not going to work because you can't get the essence of being that age. Yeah. You can't have a 14-year-old suddenly, oh, but now we're going to look eight or, you know, it's not. Yeah. This is, you'll miss the human essence of that. Yeah. At least for the foreseeable future. Maybe there's some point way ahead that you could program in something, but I, I really think the human quality of the actual age and people is irreplaceable in this case, for sure. You know, I don't see how you could do it otherwise. And having spent as much time as you have on this project and with these kids, what do you as a director see in the movie that the, the rest of us who've maybe only seen it once at this point don't see? When we see it a second or third or fourth oh my time... Gosh. <laughs> Little flaws, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> No. Um, I mean, does the uh, film get richer to you yeah, as you see it? Uh, yeah, or does it, yeah. Is there a diminishing, a point of no return at some point? Diminishing returns. I think it does. I'm prejudiced, but, yeah. you know, I, I still get, I find myself when watching, I get really kind of, find myself kind of moved at different places for yeah. inexplicable reasons. Yeah. And it's just emotional. It's just some, at that moment, you're thinking about a, something in your own past and it hits you emotionally and, the film triggers little things, so yeah. it's, it's kind of fun to see the gamut of response, but it, it, it tends to have an emotional response. So you cast your daughter in this. Mm -hmm. She's terrific. I was wondering at one point, it, this easily could have been, at about halfway through, it could have been called girlhood instead yeah. of boyhood, no, she's and a, she's a, a dynamo of a, of a presence. Was there a point at which you felt like, or did she resent the fact that the movie was shifting away from her <laughs> and whether she, where she could have been the star? And if so, do you, how did you resolve that? You're now dealing with a fictional growing up yeah. of your own actual daughter. That must have been a mind. Well, it was a fun life project for both of us, that's for sure. Okay. But, I mean, she kind of demanded to be in the movie as an eight-year-old. She was very, she had grown up on movie sets. She had been in other of my movies, little you know, uh -huh. presence here and there and uh, she was singing and dancing and she was that little extroverted eight-year-old who isn't you know and then uh, a few years in I could tell she shifted she was kind of becoming more she's a painter she was sculpting and a little less extroverted and uh -huh. she had her own I think the film probably m meant something to her and Eller uh, different things at different times but at some point she wanted out she was Is like, right? can my character die? <laughs> <laughs> like, as much as I'd love to kill off your character, no. no. It's too dramatic for the film. So yeah. shut up and get back to work. No, we, we had a lot of fun. But 
I wanted it to mirror kind of his perspective. You know, when you're young and you're sharing a bedroom with your siblings, they're in your face. They're such a part of your life. Oh, yeah. And then you get a little older and they less. They're in their own world. They've got their own friends. They've got their own That's life. That's true. And so the film kind of mirrors by yeah. the end. It's really just him. Yeah. It, Less parents, less siblings, less, you know, it's more him, him, him. So I knew it would kind of peel off and be that. But, and yeah, you're right. In the first episodes, it's, it could be called, you know, my, one of my favorite films about childhood is Ingmar Bergman's Fanny and Alexander. Oh so for God. a second, I was going to call this, you know, Mason and Samantha. Oh, that would be a good title, you know. That's, I was talking to Zach before, and he said, oh, my God, Fanny and Alexander is my favorite film about uh, yeah. about childhood. And then I noticed that you listed in your top ten, but the TV edition is something. That, that's the longer version. The five-hour version. The five-hour version. Oh, you're so cool. Yeah, <laughs> the that. criteria in five-hour yeah. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. That's so great. So now, because you're a filmmaker dad, did you not or did you do more video tape your own kids I mean do you have yes. hours and hours of oh, that the first time around I have a tenure guy I have two ten year old twins oh wow girls so the first time around oh I was documenting everything I, I would sit her down and interview her every six months like <laughs> yeah. so what's going on here That's so because I thought she would maybe want all this footage and do something interesting and she just can't stand any of it I mean she's like oh I haven't shown it to her lately but yeah, and then this next time around, every dance recital, I'm filming it, and yeah. it's also important. And, you know, this time around, I'm saying, you know what, screw it. I want to be in the moment. I'm yeah, not doing any of that. I, I think every dad can relate to yeah. that. I miss every single one of my kids' childhoods because I was behind I had the a day camera. And then camera. you're missing your own, like the pictorial yeah. history of your kid. You're not in it. I think so. Yeah, you, yeah we have all this footage, and it's everybody except me because yeah. I'm running the camera. And I said, you know what? Forget that. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna do that. So I'm. Uh, so Halloween's you, come and go, and there's no. You have no plans then, because I really think you could make the um. You could make childhood the you know the Richard Linklater family video, the home home movies that would be just as powerful because it's about <laughs> real life. Your movies, they're yeah. fictional setting, but it's basically the same thing. It's, it's pretty real. <laughs> oh, it just, you know. Home videos, they just don't look right. They're not filmed right. They're, yeah. not, they're yeah. not well You're lit. Too critical. They're not well acted. Okay, it is you know, like, you gotta, you know. My final question then, because I see we have to go. <laughs> my final question then is about this idea. Um, what's what's most striking about it, besides the, the absolutely ingenious premise, is that the movie, even going in, I knew I was going to love it. I knew, but it was not what I expected because... It's not a, mo a moment, a movie of high drama moments. Mm -hmm. It's not like the highlights of one's life. It's about the small moments. There's yeah. so many scenes I love. That scene where he's with the older boys and they're kind of sort of talking about sex and they're oh, sort yeah. of talking about. It's just like they're. It's like nothing happens. <laughs> but I, I absolutely love that. But I want to know what was your philosophy behind? Really, it's a series of low moments, <laughs> but but real moments that make this movie yeah. so brilliant. Well, yeah, it's choices. It's like, oh, do I show the first kiss? Do I do that? And yeah. it's like, you know, I, I've, I've seen it. It's been done. It's not, you know, those big moments in your own. Life to me were the personal moments, the things that you remember years later, the the big moments that everyone talks about. They're like you're like an extra in your own, you know, in the production. You're not even. I like the ones that were it's completely yours. And you know, as you look back on your life, why am I still remembering that? And yeah. I got to do that. Like, yeah, there was that camp out with those older guys who were <laughs> talking all that smack. And, right. You know what was that? That must have meant something, you know, you, those kind of things. Yeah, nothing happens. You think something's going to happen. Even yeah. in the movie, you can feel the audience getting, like, they, yeah. oh, they're throwing those saw blades at yeah. the, like someone's going to lose a limb exactly. or something. But they're, it doesn't really happen because yeah. it pretty much doesn't happen in life. Yes. That yeah. kind of stuff. There's not the big trauma, you know, you get through it usually. And, uh, but yeah, it all adds up to something. So. <laughs> okay, and then finally, I, I promised somebody I would ask this question. Is Bernie really living with you? Yeah. Well, he's living in my garage apartment. Okay. Austin's a city of garage apartments. You know, he's got but so do you have daily interaction with him? Um, I saw him yesterday. Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah he was at my daughter's 21st birthday. Is that right? Uh, Lorelai from the movie. Yeah. She turned 21. And yeah, Bernie came over, got some, had some cake. And yeah. He's doing well. He's in his third week, just finishing his third week of work. He's good. He's going to be a good citizen. You know, he's spent 17 years behind bars. Yeah. But it is an interesting case of life, art, life. And, you know, you live with your films in a, yeah. in a strange way, but you make a film based on something real like that, and that was the real-life repercussion. That was a 
Bernie was an interesting legal case, and I'm yeah. not surprised some legal minds kind of grabbed that after they saw the movie and learned a little more. And it, yeah. it, two years later, it ends up with him out of prison, and I'm really happy with that because I think yeah. you know, he served his time. Your life is entwined with your movies like a lot of filmmakers, but I don't know any other filmmaker would be doing what you're doing with Bernie. <laughs> I couldn't really give you credit for that. Well, he's a good guy. He's a yeah. friend. You know, it's, it's, no, it's no big sacrifice you for need me. To you know. invite Jack Black down. <laughs> for a anyway, listen, I could go on and on. I haven't even begun to look at your career. I really appreciate yeah, yeah. you coming oh, by here and taking you. the time. It's really a... Yeah. You're fat. I, I love the fact that we have an industry that allows you to continue your work. I mean, this is Barely. Yeah. I, I wonder if that's true, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, you know, some Somehow, some way, you know. Well, good luck. And the Before <laughs> Trilogy is just, it's one of the great things of all time. Oh, I just, you. I really love it and don't have time thank to talk you. about it now, but thank you're, you you're the best, Richard. Oh, yeah. Thanks well, a lot. Great being here today.